I would like to recognize first uh, my co-authors, Anthony Gopont and Richard Gladwell. In this presentation, we describe the history of the archaeological site in Deerfield that was originally known as the Dedic site, now renamed the Sugarloaf site, and our microscopic analysis of the tool mapping waste plates that left there, that were left there by Paleo Americans. Now, let's see. Human habitation of New England became possible after retreat of the Laurentide ice sheet. Um, by 15,000 years ago, the ice front had receded to northern Massachusetts. Glacially, Hitchcock formed as meltwaters were dammed in Rocky Hill in central Connecticut. The lake covered much of the Connecticut and Pioneer Valleys and eventually drained by 13 to 14,000 years BP, exposing the lake bed. The archaeological site was first exposed in 1936 by the destructive force of that year's hurricane. Since then, local farmers and collectors have known of the artifacts on the ancient sandy lake bed, but no archaeological research was done until 1978, when Tom Ulrich, a University of Massachusetts student, tested the site. He recovered fluid projectile points identified as Paleo-American due to concern for the safety of the site the town was advised to bury it under 10 feet of sand to protect it from future re for future research. In 1998, Bradley was granted permission to excavate on the farmland adjacent to the Deerfield property. He recovered six fluted points, tools, and waste lakes, as well as a cache of 33 points and a bi and bifaces of Chert and Rylan. Bradley renamed the location Sugarloaf site after the nearby geological landmark to the northeast. I didn't know there was a wonderful story about it. <laughs> the farmland has since been purchased by the state of Massachusetts, restricting any future subservice. Disturbance beyond farming. In 2013, Brown was In 2013, Brown was granted permission to excavate along the south border of the sandy berm seen here. The stratigraphic profile of the site includes the sand that has drifted or washed down onto the black topsoil. Most of the prehistoric artifacts were recovered below the dark soil horizon. In 2013 excavation, 25 pounds of lithics were recovered that included 42,000 waste flakes and 25 projectile points and knives of chert and rhyolite, com complete or fragmented, along with charcoal and bone. The uncalibrated radiocarbon date of the bone is 10,350 years BP, with a calibrated age of 12,350 approximate years before present. Many fluted chert points. Let's see here. There we go. Many fluted chert points and fragments that were recovered in 2013 were conjoined and mended by Bradley. Cherts predominate in the collection with the exception of two large spear points of tan spherulitic rhyolite. Predominate in the collection with the exception of two large sphere points of tan spherulitic rhyolite. One has a broken tip. The other, the other was recovered uh, in three pieces in the same excavation unit. <laughs> when conjoined, the three fragments formed a point nine inches long, 22.5 centimeters. All the projectile points would have been suitable for large hunting large game, such as caribou. Samples of the chert identified as New York's Hudson Valley lithics are undergoing X-ray fluorescence to determine specific chert sources. As for the rhyolite, opinions differed about whether it was from the Boston Volcanics or from New Hampshire's Mount Shasta rhyolite dike in Berlin. At early sites in New England, only stone artifacts have survived. Consequently, archaeologists have focused their research not only on mapping techniques of tools, 
stylistics and newswear, but also what NAFTA's preferred for tools. We pursued the latter. Guided by available regional geology, we might determine where Paleo-Americans came from and if they went prospecting or trading for other suitable rock. But first, the tool materials had to be identified accurately. Macroscopic inspection alone of hand specimens is not sufficient to identify all rocks. Therefore, we undertook petrographic analysis of artifacts prepared in this section. When viewed microscopically, a slice of rock glued to a glass slide and ground thin enough to allow light to pass through the rock is an effective method for identifying most lithics based on their crystalline structure and content. Because the process is destructive, we sampled only waste plates rather than form tools for the thin section. The advantage of waste plates is that waste plate is debris. Most debris is left in situ, and that can provide new information on NAPRA's activities at the site. The 42,000 flakes were separated by rock type microscopically. Only 800 appeared not to be Hudson Valley shirt, but rather quartz, quartzite, rhyolite, basalt, pegmatite, and others that could not be assigned identities. A non-random sample of 26 flakes that appeared to be representative of the other 800 was selected. Crystalline quartz was excluded because it's easily identified. Selection was biased to test rhyolite waste flakes that varied microscopically. Part of each flake was prepared in the thin section and the remainder was saved for comparative analysis. Petrographic results were surprising. Four were indeed Hudson Valley shirt, one of which was loaded with calcite and dolomite crumbs in a grave of fire finishing quartz. And I'm sorry, I slide that one. Microscopically, the rhyolite flakes in section were fine grain silica with calcetin fibers, stereolitic black architecture of magnetite, as well as quartz and sanidine phenocris. One artifact flake. Thin section matched Pollock's Pollock Hamilton of Boisbert. Description of his geological samples from Mount Jasper's Dyke as flow band and spherolytic rhyolite with the mineral sanidine and quartz. A crystal that is barely visible macroscopically in the flake is a sanidine phenocrest for the Carl's Van Twin. The magnification of the thin section is less than one millimeter across the section and at higher power is in cross polarized light. It's cross -polarized light. Another rhyolite flake section has rusty material that has pushed outward to form cereals. For comparison, Grammy provided a geological sample from Mount Jasper. Provided a, a geological sample from Mount Jasper rhyolite dike that he had prepared in this section. It has cereals. <coughs> rounded ellipses and flow band and high magnification, the spherules are distorted into ellipses by the flow. Hunters coming to Connecticut from distant source areas may have brought the rhyolite with them or the rhyolite was quarried collected by Sugarloaf Nappers themselves during their travels, exploration and trade. Sure, and rhyolite are represented by flakes and tools at the site, but notably not the other uh, more local material that we examined in this section. Three of these were quartzite. In one, of, in one of the metamorphosis, quartzite grains fit together, forming 123 junctions, perhaps making the rock fracture predictably when napped. The quartzite contained muscovite, biotite, and magnetite, but no feldspar. Absence of feldspar is characteristic, characteristic of the clough quartzite formation that extends along the eastern waterfall from Cobalt, Connecticut, north through Massachusetts to Clough Mountain, New Hampshire. Now, the eastern waterfall is where the yellow and the green 
come together. That is the Eastern Border Bomb. And uh, um, Dave was talking about the Eastern Border Bomb again. The source of four lumpy, weathered waste plates that looked like basalt were identified as local basalt from the Sugarloaf Formation, that is sandstone kept by the Holyoke Basalt Flow at the northern end of the Hartford Deerfield Basin. The upper portion of the basalt flow is the entablature. Where the lava cooled more quickly and is finer grain than the lower portion, known as the colonnade. Three basalt sections have characteristic feldspar lines. And I'm going to show you. But um, anyway, <laughs> they have a different name geologically. Um, this is peroxine and plagioclase crystals, as well as a formation of opaque material that is sometimes referred to as flying yeast. This dendritic magnetite is a result of rapid cooling and crystallization. Also present are small spherical or hemispherical patches of iron rich minerals, peroxine, and magnetite. These textures are common in the upper part of the entablature of the Holyoke flow of the Sugarloaf Formation. The field of view here is one millimeter across the section. A fourth plate is a badly rusted basalt that is different from the others. Its magnetite grains are equine shaped rather than dendritic, indicating that it is from the lower part of the Holyoke flow, the colonnade. Five gray waste flakes could not be identified in thin section, as hand specimens had rough, not slick surfaces that admitted no clay odor or moistened. When seen microscopically, four flakes were quartz with gray stereolytic patches with sweeping extension. There was no bedding or evidence of metamorphism in these tree flakes. One unknown is loaded with magnetite. Accessory plates highlights the orientation of the quartz. The unknown specimens might be identified with the use of an electron probe. With the lithics occurred, where the lithics occur geologically is another question. We have not seen the silicious material in the 7, 000, several thousand artifacts that we have examined petrographically for other research of sites in the Northeast. These ancient people needed rock that would cleave predictably when struck, had few inclusions that might interrupt percussion waves, and that could ultimately be shaped into sharp-edged tools. What they carried with them from sources to the west suggested that they were insecure about new territory, the Connecticut Valley, and its available tool materials. They planned ahead and came prepared with navigable rocks, pounds of it. Nevertheless, they were willing to explore other resources. The local material they may have tested glacially deposited cobbles, but more likely quarried directly from the nearby rock formations. The choices reflect the region's geology. However, there is a marked difference between the general grain size of parent formation and the finer grain material the quarry or have selected. And I see that commonly. This doubtless required experimentation to determine the napper's qualities of the rock and its edge properties. For comparison of contemporaneous sites, 
We recently reviewed the Bull Brook collection of Ips from Ipswich, Mass. The Nappers at this Eastern, Eastern Paleo site also relied upon Hudson Valley Church, augmented by regional and local lithic resources. They used other churches as well as, as, well as Rhyolite from local Boston area volcanics. But not any stereolithic Mount Jasper Rhyolite that we could detect microscopically in hand specimen. In conclusion, the Connecticut Valley was attractive for large game and consequently for early hunters who came prepared with reliable tool material to ensure that they had effective weapons for the hunt. Petrographic analysis of only a fraction of the thousands of waste flakes from the Sugarloaf site provided intriguing results that reflect the adaptive skills of the hunters as they pursued new resources that could extend or enhance their hunting. Their lives depended on it. Thank you.